how to take care of as we get to the finish line. <coughs> but one of the things that I <coughs> haven't talked about, uh, at least in any detail, is that Ruby requires this uh, science literacy business to be done for all these gateway classes. And this is a gateway class. There are about 10 or 12 courses in university wide for which science literacy uh, is done. So let me explain to you what science literacy is and what you what you need to do. So my goal is to have you spend the minimum amount of time uh, in doing this because it's really more like general knowledge rather than by what you're doing. So for that reason, the best thing to do is uh, that I'm supposed to be testing it and recording the scores of it. So what we're going to do is as follows. Uh, you will see that in the on Blackboard, uh, on UbiLearn, uh, there are there is an area called content. Okay. And in that content there are a whole bunch of things that are that have been put in there. It took me about an hour and a half to figure it out because the thing wasn't working the way it was supposed to be working. But at any rate, now it is. So what you have to do, I'll give you an email very soon, probably in a day or two. So what I want you to do is go through three of those SLI, science literacy index, whatever, modules. Uh, you will see that it's a whole bunch of PowerPoint pages. It's about 10, 15 pages, I think, per module. Uh, but it's supposed to be on topics that are of general interest, and, and the idea is for universities to make sure that students are, are aware of some of these general interest stuff, like global warming, ethics, blah, 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 these kind of stuff. Uh, they're interesting. I mean, I've gone through most of them. They're pretty interesting. And, and for somebody who is unaware, it's a pretty good thing. It's pretty easy to do. You just sit and go through it. However, I am supposed to test you on it. And that score goes to the uh, undergraduate uh, dean's office, because they keep track of whether this is being done. And that's part of, a, of the university's overall reporting system to an accreditation board. So this is not a big deal, but at the same time, the data is a big deal because I am supposed to report this data to the university, and this is one of the courses in which I'm supposed to be doing this. In most courses, this is not done, but this is one of the key courses that students take as they get into uh, various majors. So that's the reason why. So, so you'll get an email from me telling you which SLIs you want to go through. There are three of them that's required, and I will throw in a few questions in the final exam, uh, that will be on this stuff. Don't get nervous. The final exam is a comprehensive exam, as you know. But this is going to be a very small uh, part of it, maybe you know, a five-pointer or something like that, but five or seven-pointer type. So it, it's not something that the grade in it is terribly important. But at the same time, that grade is recorded. So if all of you, you know, get a zero, that's not going to look very very good for any of us, it's certainly not you. Uh, you are supposed to, it's a self-learning thing. It doesn't have any reflection on how bad or good I am. So, but at any rate, go through it. It doesn't take long. It's not a, it's much easier than the safe driving uh, PowerPoint that you go through, if you, if you have ever done that. It takes, a, you say it takes six to eight hours. It took me about 30 hours. I did pass it without any errors, but man, that was hard. This is nothing compared to it. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty easy stuff. But we need to do it. I've been doing it for the past, I think, three years. Uh, there hasn't been any complaints. It works pretty well. So I don't think you'll have any trouble. But be sure that you don't wait in getting it done. And the reason I say this is because, as you know, it's a comprehensive exam. So I'm going to give you a prep sheet again for the final exam uh, sometime early next week. Uh, so once you get the prep sheet, I really don't want you to be wasting time doing other things. Okay, So be between, between the time I send out the email and the prep sheet, I want you to actually go through all the SLIs and be ready for it. Uh, 
alternative, you can do it just before the exam, but that's not a good idea because it's going to be a few points. And this is mostly general knowledge stuff, so you shouldn't forget once you've gone through it. So my recommendation is get it done. Uh, set aside a couple of hours and get it done uh, early next week when you get my email. Okay, any questions? Yes. Okay, good question. Test trays are ready. Uh, I held off on getting them out because uh, I needed some of the exams to be uh, revisited. Uh, and they, that's been completed last night, so you are going to get your test grades by very soon. Uh, in fact, I have them. Right, do I have them in my office? Okay. So I have them in my office. So uh, you can come get it from me. Um, I think the average is close to 60%. It's about 59-ish percent. Some people did do very badly, and uh, it seems like you know that's almost unavoidable because some of you are you think you are studying, but you're not, and there is not much I can do if you think wrong. But uh, if you're in trouble, uh, certainly see me. I'll do the best I can to help you. But don't screw up the SLI stuff, okay? Because it's important. The score gets reported, and uh, I, I don't want any uh, any weird stuff happening there. It's it's not a very important thing for us academically, but it's an important reporting uh, component of this course. All right. So. Let's do a few things. We have a few of the later chapters uh, building on to the stuff we have done with harmonic oscillators. And uh, so let's, let's think about stuff that we have already done and why uh, some of this is of interest. So for example, I will take a, I will do a simple thought experiment on the board, okay? So the thought experiment is like this. Uh, you have a spring. A vertical spring, we have mostly been, been dealing with horizontal springs. This is a vertical spring. And suppose you have, you have a mass here, and you have some kind of a recording device tied to this mass, and uh, you, have a, you have a string that's attached to this mass that ties into a wall. So this is our experiment. This is a string, that's a mass m, that's a spring of spring constant k. In general, that's not important. And, and this is your, your mass is tied to a spring, and the spring is attached to an end wall, and the spring is tight. So in other words, the spring is, let's assume, a horizontal. So now we'll do a simple uh, thing. We'll actually pull this mass down and let it go. All right, we pull it down and let it go. And what you expect will happen is that the mass will essentially bounce up and down, right? So as the mass bounces up and down, what will happen is that this end of the string will start to be moved up and down, and that end will be fixed. And in the end, uh, as it starts to move up and down, you'll basically see that there will be waves like this in which the spring will be dancing. So as the mass goes back and forth, these waves coming from the fact that the string is tied to this mass, will go back and forth. So the vibrations uh, of this string would be in the vertical direction, this way and that way as well. However, as the string is dancing, the excitation that you have initiated in the string is moving from left to right, and then there is a wall and then right to left, and left to right, and right to left. That's a very simple thing to visualize, I hope. And you can, you can do this yourself uh, at home, and it's not a big deal. But why is this interesting or important? Well, it's important because this kind of a wave, where the vibrations are perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is propagating, which is forward, backward, forward, backward, uh, is called a transverse wave. It's called a transverse. There are two kinds of waves we'll deal with. Transverse waves, and also, very soon I'll talk about uh, longitudinal waves. Uh, so this one is not a longitudinal wave. I'll tell you about longitudinal waves in a minute. 
So transverse wave and non-suit. This is a transverse wave because the vibrations are transverse. Um, th th there is a very obvious example of transverse waves. It's not obvious to us because we don't see it, but that's light. Okay, so light, x-rays, anything on the light spectrum uh, propagates in a transverse wave. So if light is propagating in one direction, then it turns out that there are electric fields that are vibrating perpendicular to the direction of propagation, and a magnetic field that, vibrate, that vibrates perpendicular to the electric field and to the direction of propagation. So there are two vibrations going on in light. And any kind of light, x-rays, you know, uh, infrared waves, microwaves, all of them have the same property. So that's a transverse wave. And it's a, it's a very common and most important, perhaps, transverse wave that we deal with. But this is a mechanical transverse wave, which it, it is on a string. Now, a few simple things. When we talk about waves, we should talk about uh, stuff like the speed of the wave or velocity of the wave. Because waves typically tend to travel in straight lines, but not always. And we also need to talk about the frequency of the wave. as well as um, the wavelength of the wave. So these are three of the very important things that characterize the properties of a wave. So in this case, from crest to crest, don't talk. This is the wavelength lambda. We've already seen this, the wavelength lambda. The time period t, 1 over t is the frequency. We have already done this. You know that well. Uh, so we have the frequency f is 1 over t. t is the period. but That means the time taken to go from here to here. Uh, we have the wavelength lambda and also a, a speed, let's say v. So these are the three quantities that are very important when we talk about waves. Now, just to be clear, when I talk about a wave, a normal, simple wave like this, simple harmonic motion type wave, the speed is fixed. Okay? The speed is unique to the characteristics of the system. The speed is fixed. So it's not like if you uh, make the you know, uh, wave amplitude larger or something, the speed changes. It's not like that. The speed is fixed. So therefore, uh, that also gives you a very easy way, it turns out, of connecting the speed and lambda and f. So speed, let's say v, as we know, is distance over time. Right? That, we know that. that. That's the definition of speed. And distance over time basically means, in this case, uh, this v should be equal to the wavelength which is this distance that I have marked up here, uh, traveled in the period of time t. So it is very easy to see that the speed, which is unique to the wave, is connected to lambda and connected to t. In other words, that leads us to a very important relationship that you must never forget, that this is lambda times f, because f is 1 over t. All right? So this is a very important relationship. And this relationship is something that you need to most certainly know henceforth. So this is one way of relating the speed of the wave to the wavelength and the frequency. So in other words, I said this is fixed for a wave. So if this is fixed for a wave, does that mean lambda and f are also fixed? The answer is no. Lambda can vary, and correspondingly, f can vary. But lambda times f is a constant. That's the idea. Okay? Don't, don't forget about it. It's very important for the fundamentals. Lambda times f is a constant. But it turns out that these two can vary. There is another thing that's going on here. There is actually another way of finding uh, the speed of the wave in the string like that. So that's a completely different way. It's another way. to find the speed of a wave in a string. It's 
So this now raises an interesting issue because I just told you that this speed is fixed. And if you fit the speed, then lambda and f are, are related because lambda f is, is speed, right? But there is another way to find the speed. And this turns out to be a way in which you can actually control the speed. So it turns out that this v, the speed of the wave, is equal to the tension in the string. I'll call it ft, because very soon we'll be using big T for temperature. So as so not to be confused, I'll call it ft, which is the tension, which is how tight the string is, uh, divided by the mass per unit length of the string, which I'll call mu, square root. So you can do some simple dimensional analysis and see this comes out to be the speed of the wave. So here, let's define them then. f of t is the tension in the string. So what I'm telling you is that if a string, suppose you're fishing, yes? I'll tell you. Hold your horses. So mu is mass per unit length. All right? So tension in the string is very important because if I make a string very tight, then it means that the weight speed will be faster. So the, you, you should know this because if any of you have played the piano or the guitar or something, and the tension in the string is very important, right? That's what you are that's what you are typically very concerned about, such that you don't get a lousy sound at the other, at the other end. What you're really dealing with is the material, which is it gives you the mass per unit length, how long the string is, what material is made of, which fixes its mass. So mu, therefore, has to do with the material of the string, and how tight or how loose the string is gives you the tension of the string, and that in turn gives you V, okay, the speed at which sound travels through the string. So it turns out then that if you want to control this V, this is the way to do it. These are the two guys. So mu, therefore, is the mass per unit length of the string. So if the mass is, let's say, m0, it's m0 over L, if L is the length of the string. All right? So these are the two things. I, I'm not going to derive this for you. I'm just going to leave it like this. I think it's intuitively, it is easy to remember that speed is tied to the tension force divided by the mass per unit and square root. Now, if you forget the square root, that shouldn't rattle you very much, because you can certainly do a dimensional analysis of this. This is mass per unit length, m over l. Force is mass times acceleration, so mass mass cancels out. And then uh, this is going to be, acceleration is going to come in here. So it's going to be, eventually, if you go through it, it'll be l over p. That's the dimension of it that's going to come out. So from purely dimensional considerations, you should be able to see that this formula makes sense, although it doesn't lend itself to being derived from purely dimensional consideration. All right. So all of these that I've talked about are for transverse waves. Suppose you have gone fishing. So here is your fishing line. Uh, and you have caught, let's say, a nice fish. And the fish looks, should not be happy about it. And the fish, let's say, is tugging uh, onto, this, onto this string. And what you will feel is that you will feel a tension Ft. Uh, and of course, the fish li fishing line is made out of certain material, so you'll have divided by mu. So that will actually give you the speed of sound in the fishing line, right? So if you catch a big fish, the speed of sound will be higher. If you catch a teeny tiny fish, your speed of sound will be not so much. So these are relatively simple things to do. Uh, we covered these for a variety of reasons. Much of, much of it is really uh, knowing the basic applications. But thus far, I've been talking about transverse waves. Let's talk about longitudinal waves a little bit. So what are longitudinal waves? <laughs> These are kind of interesting guys. 
So longitudinal wave essentially is a wave. So suppose the wave is propagating from left to right. All right. A longitudinal wave is basically some initial pressure pulse. So it's like a pressure pulse. For example, I'm talking to you, which I am. So as I speak, some energy is being transmitted through the air, right, from my mouth, all over this place, hitting your eardrum, tympanic membrane or whatever, and eventually your brain is interpreting what I'm talking about, right? So how does the sound go from my mouth to your ear? Basically, it's a pressure pulse that is traveling through the air. That's what's happening. So if there weren't any air, if we were on the moon, and this classroom were on the moon, I would be talking away, and guess what? You won't be able to hear me. Because there is no pressure pulse that will be going from me to you. Now, if the temperature in this room is very cold, I'll sound different. It turns out that for relatively small variations in temperature, it won't sound very interesting. It would sound about the same. But if the temperature goes real low or real high, then if you actually measure it, the sound will be different that, that you will hear. Okay? So at any rate, it's a pressure pulse. And this pressure pulse is moving forward. So actually, it becomes like this. It, original density was something. So, the, so this is a dense region. And so this dense region hops forward and so on and so forth. That's how a longitudinal pulse propagates. It's a longitudinal wave. So an example of a longitudinal wave is sound wave uh, through air, for example, water, etc. <coughs> it's actually a sound wave. That sound wave is essentially a longitudinal wave. So you can immediately see that the speed of this wave is going to be strongly dependent upon the medium through which it's propagated. So for example, sound speed in air, so let's call it C, sound speed in air. Uh, this is about 330 meters per second, depending again upon temperature and so on and so forth. But that's typically the sound speed in, in air. Again, sound speed is sound speed. It doesn't matter if it's a chipmunk who is making the sound or if it's me who is making the sound, because the speed is the same. It's the frequency and the wavelength that would not be the same between me and the chipmunk. The chipmunk will have a higher frequency. So higher frequency would mean a smaller wavelength. Chipmunk is not a particularly imposing creature. So a smaller wavelength is understandable. Uh, I'll have a larger wavelength and a lower frequency. All right. So, but the speed would be the same. It's about 330 meters per second. Uh, again, if I if I'm talking uh, in liquid nitrogen, sorry, in gaseous nitrogen-filled room, I would actually sound different because propagation of sound in nitrogen would be different. I would sound different than Mars. All right. So, so again, the same thing applies then. So we again have the same relationships period. The C, therefore, would be lambda times f. Or you can call it v, whatever. So let us now talk about uh, some very interesting things that you can do with sound waves, which we do. So almost all musical instruments that we have uh, are tied to uh, this kind of stuff. So suppose I first take a string. And this can be like my piano string. And I can pluck it somewhere. And it is possible, depending upon where I pluck it, to have all kinds of vibrations of the string. Now, one thing is for certain, if the two ends of the string are tied, those two ends can't vibrate. They are fixed. So the fixed points are called nodes. So this is a technical language. So these are the nodes. Nodes are the points that don't vibrate points where you don't hear anything. So if I now, let's call this thing length L. Uh, let's pluck it in the middle. If I pluck it in the middle, 
then you know and I know what's going to happen. It's going to start to vibrate. And the stable vibration, if I pluck it in the middle, would be like this. It would be going back and forth like this. So the maximum amplitude of vibration will be the middle. Uh, that's the middle. And that's called an anti note. It's called an anti note. And if you consider the full wave, right, then this point to this point is one full oscillation, and that is the wavelength lambda of this wave. So in this case, you just have this piece here. So therefore, you have lambda over 2, right, half of lambda. So then L, the length, is lambda over 2. Right? L is lambda over 2. Any questions? Sir? OK. Stop me if you have questions, because I'm going to. Uh, so clearly, then, you can write uh, lambda as 2L. Okay? Lambda is therefore uh, 2L. And one more second. Um, all right. So now suppose I don't pluck it that way. I pluck it in a different way. I plug it in such a way that I now have a vibration, which is this. Again. Nothing can happen at these two points because these are the nodes, and the wave is going to go like that and come back out. So the steady state pattern would be like this. So this point now will also become a node. These two are already nodes. And uh, these two will be the anti nodes. So anti-node will be here, and also will be here. So clearly, you can see that the, the vibration here is different. And it turns out that the entire wavelength lambda will be equal to L. So uh, that's easy to see. Since speed is fixed, uh, I already know that uh, sound velocity v is frequency times lambda. So lambda is 2L. So F times 2L. Therefore, the frequency is going to be V over 2L. Can you go lower than this frequency in this case? Two ends are fixed, right? So question is, can you go lower than this frequency? In other words, can you sustain can you sustain a wave, a propagating wave going back and forth, which is less than this in length? So can you, for example, think about making a system, this system, where this point is frozen, that point is an anti -node. That's not possible because I have already fixed the set, right? So I can't, I can't allow this here. What I can allow is this. So in other words, I can't go less than this wavelength here. It's not sustainable, which is why I'll call this, uh, I don't know if I call it, I call it FZ, F1. So this is the lowest frequency I can get. All right. This is the lowest frequency. I can't get a lower frequency. So once I fix L, the lowest we can take it. However, here I, I have uh, F2 is equal to V over lambda now is equal to L. So V over L, and therefore F2 will be twice F1. So I can get the next frequency up, an integer multiple, 
twice the old frequency by by creating this vibration. So you see these vibrations basically give you the fundamental and the overtones, the various harmonics that you can get. Now this is not a particularly good musical instrument, especially not a wind instrument, because both ends are closed. So you won't be able to hear it. Both ends are closed as a musical instrument. You won't be able to hear it. But this is a perfectly fine string instrument, for example, a guitar or a piano and what have you, because there, two ends of the string will end up being fixed. And therefore, this kind of vibration would be possible, that kind of vibration would be possible, and so on and so forth, all right? So depending upon what kind of wave you are initiating, how the string is set up, what are the boundary conditions, you can get all of these. So the other thing that you can also do, for example, you can go even higher in frequency. So the wavelength here is like this, but I can, I can imagine, this is not a good drawing. Um, too little space. Okay, so I can imagine this. So again, you have nodes, but now you have three anti-nodes. So all of these are anti-nodes. Instead of two anti-nodes, you have three anti-nodes. One, two, three. And these are, of course, your nodes. Uh, and uh, uh, these two are also uh, fixed. So these are also your nodes. So you have three anti-nodes and four nodes. So these are actually real. Whenever you take a string instrument, you are actually exciting all these vibrations. So now you see, so this is lambda over two, another lambda over two, another lambda over two. So you have three lambda over two. So L therefore in this case is three lambda over two. So therefore this implies that lambda is two third L. So therefore F3 is V over L, uh, sorry, V over, uh, F is V over lambda. So V over 2 third L, so that will be 3V over 2L. So 3V over 2L would basically be uh, 3 times F1. All right? And you can make higher and higher and higher modes this way. And that's what we typically do when we have string instruments. We can put them up into all these different vibrational modes. Again, as, as you can see, uh, this is really very simple geometry, and you have to understand the conceptual foundation of how this is being done. But if you have ever played the piano or played the guitar or any other string instrument, then this is the dynamics of it. But you have two nodes, and then how many anti-nodes and nodes you can generate in between the two fixed nodes is what sets the frequency uh, and the wavelength that that you have. Of course, human hearing, hearing is only over a certain range of frequencies. So our musical instruments, therefore, for example, are tuned in such a way that it's nice to hear. Some sounds one may not like, some sounds one may like, but that's because of what frequencies your ear uh, prefers and what it does not. Okay? So that kind of stuff comes in. All right. So. I can, I can add a, a word or two. Think about a wind instrument, for example. In a wind instrument, typically, there is some open uh, end. That's how the sound comes out. So let us say you have a wind instrument like this, where one end is closed and one end is open. So clearly, at the closed end, you'll always get a no. And clearly, at the open end, you want to have the maximum vibration. The maximum vibration will come out at the open end. So chances are, almost always, to have a stable uh, propagating sound, uh, this will end up being an anti. -tide. So now you have opened the possibility of actually taking the frequency lower than what you had before. So if I think in terms of amplitudes, 
because there's no amplitude here. Like just like I did there. This, this, think about this as air, okay? So it's air filled. So this is the amplitude of vibration of air molecules. So this amplitude is really how hard the air molecules are vibrating like that, but I'm plotting it along the y-axis. So it will turn out at nodes there is no amplitude, but here it'll be like this. Now, if you look at the wave that I have drawn, this therefore will be lambda over four, because this, 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 and this make up the full lambda. So this piece is lambda over four, right? So therefore, lambda over four will now be equal to L, if this is my L. Now you see, you're actually creating a, creating a wavelength, which is, uh, you're creating a frequency that's smaller, because uh, we know that V is F lambda, and uh, so lambda is equal to four L, but from here, in this case, so that will be F times four L, which means the frequency is V, which is fixed in air, divided by 4L. So you see now, this is smaller than V over 2L, which is the F1 I wrote, right on the top there. So I can call it uh, F0, if you will, that is the lowest frequency I can hit. Say so this is F1. So this happens when you have closed ends. the lowest frequency for closing. And this happens for an open-ended wind instrument, for example. So if you are playing the flute or the clarinet, as you move your finger from one hole to the other, what you are really changing is you are changing the positions of nodes and antinodes. Okay. So if you open the hole, that means you're allowing for an anti-node at the position of the hole. If you close the hole, you are allowing for a node at the position of the hole. And therefore, the frequency will change as you play your clarinet or flute, depending upon which hole you open and which hole you close. And obviously, it's very complicated because you can play with multiple holes being open and closed, and that will give you a rich array of sounds but each of them will have basically the same kind of configuration that I'm talking about. Any questions? Observation. Anybody who is an expert musician here? Really? Hey, you guys have been shy. Most of my, most of my 101 kids are far better musicians than I am. So uh, think about it. Next time you play your musical instrument, whatever it is, we're actually dealing with the stuff that I just discussed. Okay, so there is another small topic on which I want to spend a bit of time. And you all know this topic well, excepting you may not have seen the mathematical or at least the quantitative treatment of it. And that has to do with Doppler effect. <coughs> The reason why I'm doing uh, these things are because they're important and interesting applications. Doppler effect, for example, is very heavily used in so many different applications. So for example, if you are standing in a train station or if, if you are standing on the road and somebody's playing the horn, as this person comes closer to you, it would sound different. And as the person goes farther and farther away, the sound will change, right? That's Doppler effect. So as it comes closer to you, the frequency goes up, and your ear picks it up. And as it recedes farther and farther away, the frequency goes down, and your ear picks it up. So that's Doppler effect. If you look into the night sky, and if you could measure uh, the wavelength or the frequency of radiation that we are receiving, you will find that that radiation actually has frequency that's going down compared to where it started from. And that turns out to be the case no matter in which direction you look. So 
And that is because the universe is expanding. So it, it, it's actually a, one of the most uh, obvious ways of telling that the universe is expanding because everything that's emitting radiation towards us is actually receding from us. And as it recedes, uh oh, is it you? Throw it away. As it recedes, the frequency goes down because the wavelength goes up. The speed is the speed of light, which is fixed. So, speed of light through mostly vacuum. Not entirely fixed, but it's almost fixed. So, we know that the universe is expanding. It, it, that there is no big deal about it. The question is, how fast is it, is it expanding? And that we don't necessarily know really well, but we know it's expanding faster and faster. So, at any rate, so these are simple examples of. So, for example, if you ever go for a sonogram, uh, any kind of sound wave ba based uh, imaging of any part of your body, be it the heart, be it the stomach, be it whatever. Uh, what it is, is that the blood is actually moving through your, through your system. And essentially, it is the motion of the blood that is being captured by sound waves bouncing off the moving entity. And so, if it's moving towards you versus moving away from you, Doppler effect picks it up. And what you see is a Doppler image. So the idea of a Doppler effect is actually very simple. So let me just try and capture it for you in the most uh, simple terms. So suppose this is the source of the sound. And suppose here you are, the listener. I'll make things very simple here just because the concept itself is very, very simple. So clearly, the source is emitting the sound. So therefore, I can say that sound speed v is uh, lambda times the frequency with which uh, sound is being emitted uh, from, the, from the source. And therefore, I should be able to write that the frequency of the sound being emitted from the source is going to be the sound speed v over the wavelength uh, lambda. So in this case, both are fixed. The source is fixed, and you are also fixed. You are not moving. So there is no Doppler effect. So you should be then able to say that the frequency of the source, which is V over lambda, in this case, the frequency that you hear, we call it FL. This is FS. If both are fixed, then FL, the frequency that you hear, should be exactly equal to the frequency of the source, because there is no reason for it to be different. You are standing put. The source is also uh, fixed in space. So whatever frequency is being emitted is basically what's hitting uh, your ear. So now suppose that the source is fixed. And here you are, the listener. And you are moving towards the source. So what will happen now is actually rather interesting. Uh, what you will hear, FL, uh, now will become the frequency. The, the lambda hasn't changed, but it will turn out that uh, if you, if you think about this, this, this is V over uh, lambda. So lambda is not changing. The source is emitting the same thing. But the distance between the, the, the listener and the source now is shrinking because you are going towards the source. So think about this. If this is the source and this is where you are, the frequency of the source is the frequency you hear. But now suppose here is the source and you want to move towards the source. If you want to move towards the source, you would hear it sooner or later? Sooner. That means the effective velocity of the sound from the, from the source to your ear will be more or less. Come on. Velocity, I said. Curtis, you're not. What's wrong with you? Uh, so you're going closer and closer to the source. I said the distance then is shrinking, right? I said the effective speed at which 
you, the, the, the sound will reach you to be more or less. In this case, it should be more because this is the thing. So the effect is still goes up, right? How many of you got this? If you are going from Buffalo to Rochester, the distance between Buffalo to Rochester is 10. All right? So, the, so if you think in terms of effective speed, it will be your speed that is shrinking the distance. And because you have a finite speed, the distance is shrinking at a certain rate. Think about it that way. So in other words, okay. So, so in other words, what will happen here is that the effective velocity would be the velocity at, at which the sound is coming plus the velocity of the listener here. That's what it boils down to. It's a little bit tricky. But think about it. I don't know if you, have, if you guys have ever done these problems in, in school, but when I remember in seventh grade or so, we were often given these problems in math. So we had, uh, suppose you have a distance d between uh, two stations, and two trains are coming towards uh, each other. When will the trains cross? Have you guys ever done these problems? You have, right? Yeah, I know we did it in seventh grade. And I had great difficulty the first time I did it. Actually screwed it up. But it turns out that it's actually more of a conceptual thing. If you overthink it, then you, then you get yourself into a hole. The distance, is, the distance is shrinking, so the effective velocity is going up. The two velocities add up. So in this case, that's exactly what happens. So if you're going towards the source, you see V plus VL means that this, the frequency that you hear is going to be more than the source frequency. And that's precisely the reason why if, if a car blowing its horn is coming towards you, the frequency goes up. And now it's easy to see that if the listener is going the other way, or for that matter, the source is going the other way, or they have velocities that are diverging, then FL is going to be V minus VL, because VL flips sine over lambda, which means this will be less than Fs, which means that you will hear a lower and lower frequency as there is recession from a U. So this is the fundamental of Doppler effect. There's nothing more beyond this. You can make the math as complicated as you wish, but this is what it is. That's the guts of Doppler effect. Okay. So let me now switch gears to something else. Let's take water in a container. And let's put a lid on top and make sure the lid is tightly closed and touching the water. It can be any fluid. The water is the easiest fluid that we have. So I said it's touching the container, which means I'm pressing slightly onto the fluid with this lid. And let's say I'm applying a force F by pressing it here. And let's say the cross-sectional area here is A. So the pressure, therefore, would be F over A that I am exerting on this fluid. It can be a gas as well. It doesn't have to be water. But a liquid is, a, is an easy thing to think of. So if I put a pressure here, the fluid does something absolutely bizarre. What the fluid does is almost instantly as instantly as possible, this pressure that you're putting on the top will end up getting transmitted all through the fluid, undiminished, undiminished. So in other words, if the pressure here is P, the pressure here would be P, here would be P, here would be P, here would be P, smack in the middle would be P, everywhere the pressure would be P. In fluids, by the way, Newton per meter squared, that unit, is referred to as Pascal after Pascal. So, so this is an interesting result then, that, that, the, that the pressure is, is sent undiminished to the whole system. Now, 
this particular observation that the pressure is the same is called Pascal's principle. The Pascal's principle basically says that if you, if you apply a pressure on the fluid, every point in the fluid picks up the exact same pressure. Of course, it is a static fluid. It's not a moving fluid. It's a static fluid. So that's a very important thing to remember, that this must be a static fluid. No motion. This is not the case for water flowing over Niagara Falls, which is not a static fluid. It's a moving fluid. So now you see, the question is, wh why is the static fluid important? So let's see. What is pressure? Pressure basically is force per unit area. So let us say we take a unit area at this point in the vessel on the wall. Let's call this area A. And let's call uh, the force here F. So the question is, what would be the direction of the force? And I claim that the direction of the force will have to be perpendicular to this cross-sectional area. I claim that. You should ask me why, I think. What is the reason for making such a precise statement that the pressure, that the force exerted by the fluid on the wall has to be perpendicular to the surface of the liquid? So it doesn't matter if it's here or if it's here. So if I take a cross-sectional area here, uh, this is, of course, on the wall, uh, then it will turn out that the force will be that way. So in other words, the force, whichever surface you put, the force will be perpendicular. So that's a very interesting and rather bizarre thing. So let's say why it has to be that way. Suppose it's not that way. Suppose the force is not quite that. So let's assume, let's assume for now uh, that what I said is wrong. And the force can be this way or that way. It can be tilted. Force can be tilted. If the force can be tilted, then by decomposition of a vector along x and y axes, I know that I can break this force into a perpendicular piece and a parallel piece, right? Anything that is tilted, I can break it into a perpendicular piece and a parallel. You have been doing this since January. So the perpendicular piece is obviously there. So, so, so you can't say that there is no perpendicular piece. Or in other words, there is no perpendicular force on the cross-section. You can't say that. It has to be there, if there is any force at all. However, if there is a force which is uh, that way, so in other words, that's parallel to the surface, it turns out that there is no way you can stop the fluid from moving. Because then the fluid will start to flow along the edge of the wall. Okay? So what that means is that you can't have a static fluid if your force isn't perpendicular. It has to be perpendicular for it to be static. So these two are very important tied criteria. You can't have a static fluid if the force is uh, not perpendicular. All right, so why am I saying this? I'm saying this because it is very important that you recognize that this force is perpendicular to the cross-section area. It turns out, though, that force is a vector. Uh, um, what am I doing? Let me. Uh, force is a vector. Area, actually, although we haven't done this, area also is a vector, because area can be typically concave or convex, depending upon how the area is oriented. So area can also be a vector. So area vector is typically outward, and so on and so forth. So anyway, so these, are, these two are vectors. But pressure P actually is a scalar. Pressure has no sense of direction. Pressure is a scalar. So here you have one scalar quantity pressure that emerges out of two vector quantities, force and uh, area. So the reason why this is important is because Pascal's principle turns out to be something that you, you use often. Every time you go uh, 
you get your car service, for example, you're actually using Pascal's principle. So here, for example, if you think about one of these hydraulic jacks where uh, I, I'm obviously making a cartoon of this. So if it's a bad drawing, uh, you should forgive me for that. So this, for example, let's say uh, is a fluid. And the fluid has, the fluid is sitting in two different uh, chambers connected by a, by a pipe uh, between the two chambers. So here you have your fluid. And I already told you that every point in this fluid, by Pascal's principle, is a static fluid right now. So every point in this fluid will have the same pressure. So in other words, if I fix this cross-sectional area and apply a force A, then F over A is going to be the pressure P here. Let's call it F1 over A1. And the, that pressure P is then everywhere in the fluid because it is a static fluid. But now you see, if I make this cross-sectional area A2, then I'll wind up with an F2, such that I get the same pressure. So when you go to, the, to the, you know, when you take your car to the shop, and the mechanic wants to look at the look at the car, wants to lift it up. This is the hydraulic jack that is typically being used, which I'm sure you've seen. So it is easier to lift a car by using the right kind of hydraulic jack because you apply a certain pressure. This cross-sectional area and the F you apply is up to you, whereas here the car may be sitting. That's where your car may be sitting. And this will get lifted up, but if the cross-sectional area A2 is larger, then corresponding the F2 has to be larger as well. In other words, it's almost like something or nothing. It's not quite like that, but it's almost like that. Does it make sense? Yes. Then you're just increasing the pressure. Why would you do that? Eventually, the fluid will be very unhappy with you. <laughs> so, so F1 over A1 is what you apply. So you can take a tiny little area in which you just you just pump the fluid there with your foot. So you're building up a certain pressure in the fluid, and the fluid basically transmits that pressure instantaneously everywhere. Right? So now you have your car at the other end. The cross-sectional area is large. So whatever pressure you have given, the force will be therefore larger to give you the same pressure. That's the idea. However, that doesn't mean you are getting something out of nothing. Because what you are doing is the work done. Right? The energy you're putting in. So the work done here is going to be force times distance. So since the energy must be conserved, the force F1 you put in and the distance D1 by which you compressed the fluid here, that's the work done, must also be equal to F2 times D2. So in other words, if, if F2, if F2 is much, much larger than F1, then you can easily imagine that D2, correspondingly, would be much, much less than D1. In other words, you may have to pump 200 times to lift the car, lift the heavy car up, each time getting a tiny little D2, and then summatively, with all the D2s taken into consideration, you can get the car up to the point you want. In other words, you keep pumping uh, as much as you can. So, let me stop here now. We, we have some, some more work to do, including getting into atmospheric pressure uh, and Archimedes principle and flowing fluids. But we are doing OK. So let's go to the quiz now and get going. <laughs>